Come on. For him? For yes, him? Yes, they have to come on to the video. So, you cannot make it, he just make it for, help them, Jesus. We have another here. Oh, what is that? Good morning, Sister Dennis. Thank you for joining us. We will begin shortly. One call. see them. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hang the harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, Raise it, raise it even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. By the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down. Babylon, where we sat down, and uh, we went, when we remember Zion, for the wicked carry us away, captivity require from us a song, but how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? For the wicked carry us away, captivity require from us a song. Now how can we sing the Lord's song? In a strange land. Ah, 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 
when we remember Zion. For the wicked carry us away, captivity require from us the song. Now how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, Lord, today. So let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, Lord, today. By the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, and there we were, when we remember Zion. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Sister Emily, for allowing the Lord to lead you in singing this song of introduction. And uh, my friends, I want to welcome you to the second portion of our day. This morning you heard a sermon crossing the river Jabbok alone from Brother Silburn Calendar. Those of you who did not hear it, it should be posted on our YouTube page, One Accord Christian Service, later today. Very powerful sermon from Brother Silburn Calendar. We were still trying to connect today, but hopefully we can iron out the details where we can share in the worship together uh, to, to continue to improve things here at One Accord Christian Service. So all of you who are on right now, I welcome you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. The continuation of our worship here at One Accord Christian Service. We are happy for your continued support and we trust that you will continue to be blessed today by the words the Lord has to share with us. Just to get some announcements out of the way, we are not having regular program this week on Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, as you know, as I stated last Thursday, we will be, be we, we will be beginning weekly programming. That's in the month of June. From the first week of June through the fourth week of June, we will have regular programming every week because the questions are coming in. The questions are coming in, plus we have our regular programming that we also want to present. So we will be doing regular weekly programming beginning the first week of June. That is just to uh, remind you of the time. Uh, Brother Silburn Calendar comes on at um, Tuesdays, 4.30 Eastern and Caribbean time. U.S. and Caribbean time, 4.30 on Tuesday afternoons because of his time difference in London. So you join him then for Evangelism 101. I come on on Thursday nights, Thursday nights at 7.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. It's about midnight, I believe, in England. Uh, I come on at Thursdays with Gospel Reality. We are beginning every week in June. Next, uh, not this week coming, but the following week, the first week of June, we are dealing with a question sent to us by a faithful viewer, Brother Stephen Reynolds. Brother Stephen Reynolds submitted a question that we will be dealing with the first week of June, God willing. I just want to remind you as well, my friends, of our YouTube page, if you have not subscribed, you can do so today. All our past sermons and past weekly programming has been loaded on there. The sermons today will be loaded on there before the start of the week next week. So we want to invite you to join our YouTube page or go there for all our past programming that you may have missed. Now, folks, we're going to get into the message for this morning. As you can see here, I will be using my DS screen today because I have some information and some visuals that I want to present 
while the word is presented. So I trust by the grace of God that everyone can see the screen clearly. I, um, I have my wife looking at all the comments to make sure that everyone is good. She will inform me if there is any problems. But I invite you now to pray with me and ask God's continued leading on our programming today. Heavenly Father, I stand before you as a humble servant. I stand to serve you, O God, and I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit and your Holy Spirit alone, that I will accomplish this work. I am a man. This is your word. Use me, dear Lord, to send the information out there. And I pray that the hearts of your people will be blessed. I give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, for I am not worthy. You alone are worthy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Folks, today's topic is... The matrix has you. The matrix has you. Is your mind free? This program today is filled with information about our current world, not necessarily the intricate details of the world that we live in, but the core principle and system of the world that we live in. I present it today to wake us up to the world and its reality and to understand why our only hope lies in the immortal, invisible, God-only wise. I invite you to, if you have the time, share this programming with the young and with the old. We need to be woken up in the world that we live in today and its reality, my friends. It's amazing, I didn't, I didn't even know this. this. This message today is based upon the movie that was presented 20 years ago. Uh, they, they're celebrating the anniversary of it this year, the 20-year anniversary of The Matrix. When this movie came out, it captivated the minds of men. It transcended what movies were before it in terms of special effects and its action sequences. But when you break the movie down to its core principles and its message, you will realize that it is a powerful message that is applicable to the world that we live in today. So beginning in August this year, many people will flock to the theaters for the, for the re-release of The Matrix for its 20-year anniversary. They will be captivated by its scenes of action. They will be captivated and mesmerized by its amazing special effects. But what I want to do today is to dig deep within its core religious principles and understand the message that it has, which is a powerful application to the world that we live in today. To begin the presentation, I want to begin with a few quotes from a few from uh, three authors three authors who wrote three particular things that i want to point on concerning the world that we live in uh, not all of them are christians and i want us to understand that because i want us to see you see the problem with the world today is people don't want to accept when the bible tells them that something is wrong so i want us to understand that Everyone looking at this world, from whatever point of view they're looking at it, knows that they can't take it on face value. So I want to share with you these quotes about what these people wrote concerning the world that we live in today. One wrote, we are on the cusp of an incredible global change. A crossroads where we make decisions that will influence life on earth well into the future of what we call time. We can fling open the doors of the mental and emotional prisons which we have confined the human race for thousands of years, my friends. Ha. Or we can allow the agents of that control to complete their agenda for the mental emotional, spiritual, and physical enslavement of every man, woman, and child on the planet. How will they enslave them? With a world government, 
with an army, with a central bank, with currency, underpinned by a microchip population. Are you listening to me today? I need you to listen to me today very clearly. The author says, I know that sounds fantastic, but if the human race lifted its eyes from the latest soap opera or game show or sports event long enough to engage its brain, it would see that these events are not just going to happen, but they are happening. This is from the book. The Biggest Secret by David Icke. This is in the introduction of that book. Copyright 1999, my friends. He wrote this in 1999. Looking forward, I venture to say since 1999, we're in 2020. Has what he's been written come true? Yes, it has. He's looking at it from a different worldview. He's looking at it from a different worldview, but he understands what is happening in this world. And he says, we will see it too. If we take our eyes and minds from the distractions that have been carefully put for us in this world to keep us dumb to what's happening. If we take our eyes and minds of the distraction of sports, eyes and minds of the distractions of the movies, and the game shows, and the TV shows, and all the things that keep us distracted in this world. So that's the number one quote. What is the next one? I begin. A leaderless but powerful network is working to bring about radical change in the United States. Its members have broken with certain key elements of Western thought. And they may even have broken continuity with history. The Aquarian conspirators, as the author calls them, range across all levels of income and education, from the humblest to the highest. They are school teachers, office workers, famous scientists, government officials, and lawmakers, artists, and millionaires, taxi drivers, celebrities, Leaders in medicine, education, law, psychology, they are incorporated in every walk of life. Some are open in their advocacy and their names may be familiar, meaning there are people who are put on the forefront for us to see. There are people who are, whose lives are made plain and public for us all to see. Uh, uh, however, Others are quiet in their involvement, believing they can be more effective if they are not identified with ideas that have altogether been misunderstood. This book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, was written by Marilyn Ferguson in 1980, my friends. For a long time now, Many people have been on to the happenings of the world. So she says, there is a group of people and the entire thing is called the Aquarian Conspiracy. There are some they put in the forefront and there are some who work behind the scenes to accomplish their purposes in this world, my friends. Let's go to the third quote. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in a democratic society. <laughs> Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. Are you listening to me, my friends? I want us to get this. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in a democratic society. Those who, who manipulate this unseen mechanism is the true ruling power of the country. Listen to this. We are governed 
our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. When we go to the store to buy products, these products have been decided by people outside of us. They put ads on the television to motivate us and gear us to what we buy. There are different choices, they understand that, so they present a choice for everyone. While I chose this suit, someone else chose another style of suit. Why do we pick our perfumes? What celebrity wore them that motivate us to buy them? When we select them, did we know that they smelled good? Or did we know that they were presented to us by a, a celebrity or an athlete that made, the, that made it look good, my friends? What cereal do we buy? Where did we get the idea to buy it? Whatever attitude one chooses toward this condition it remains a fact that in almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind who harness all social forces and contrive new ways to bind and guide the world. This book, Propaganda, written by Edward Bernays in 1928. And the principles of the book Propaganda are live and active in the world that we live in today. Many companies use it. That's why an ad on your television may be millions of dollars, but companies would invest in that ad of millions of dollars because the benefits of that ad is you and me going to the store after seeing it and buying it. My friends, I want you to understand. When you walk in the mall, there is music playing. That music is not random. That music is carefully selected to motivate you and I to shop. I want you to understand the intricate happenings of this world. We were in a situation where stores were closed, where businesses were closed. Wall Street goes up and down. Why is Wall Street going up when businesses and stores are closed unlike any time in human history? You will be amazed to know that there are people controlling what is happening, controlling what we see, because we, let, we are led to believe that when Wall Street is going up, everything is good. So there is an influx of money into Wall Street to make it go however they want it to go. I know today, I know today that people are going to listen to this and going to say, don't listen to this madman, conspiracy theorist. I want you to understand something. When, when I'm done here, I hope you can get the reality of this world. Because it's not hidden. It's not hidden to those who are, have the ability to see it. It's hidden to those who don't want to see it. Even the government invented the term conspiracy theorist when John F. Kennedy was killed. When people came up with all those theories that it could not have been the man they said it was. They created the term conspiracy theories. So the minute you hear anything that, is, that seemingly is far-fetched, you can be dismissed as a conspiracy theorist. But I don't want you to take my word for it today. I want you to think. I want you to think about the world that we live in. I want you to see how it works and make the decision for yourself, my friend. This is serious. And I want you to run now, if you know somebody that needs to hear this, to wake up to the world, I need you to share it today. I don't normally ask this. But listen, it's time we stop playing games, my friends. It's time we recognize what is happening. No one can make a decision based on wrong information. And you will understand today that even church is not safe. I've shared with you three quotes from three authors. Not all of them were Christians. Not all of them followed God. Some of them were even Gnostic. But they recognized 
even in their condition, that there is something inherently wrong in this world. They recognize that there is a rather small percentage of people who control the wealth of the entire world. A small percentage of people. And they will power. And they keep meetings to direct the shape of the world. And they put people in the forefront. Be it politicians, be it presidents, kings and queens. They put people in the forefront who will accomplish their purpose. How many times have you voted? You see things getting any better? You think it's going to get any better? It's time to wake up, my friends. I'm going to read to you this quote now about satanic jurisdiction. Satan was seeking to shut out from men a knowledge of God and to establish his own kingdom. You think his work was done when he was cast out of heaven? He just began to work, my friends. He could not usurp the authority of God, but he still set up a kingdom. His strife for supremacy had seemed to be almost wholly successful. It is true that in every generation of God, in every generation, God had his agencies. Do you understand the condition of the world when God surveyed it in the time of Noah? Every imagination on the heart of men was wicked continually. The kingdom of Satan was set up. God looked and found faith in Noah. He found righteousness in one man. And in all the human beings that existed in the world, it was saved from the flood. The kingdom of Satan was, was erected and it was functioning effectively in the hearts and minds of men. Even among the heathen, there were men through whom Christ was working to uplift the people from their sin and degradation. But these men were despised and hated. Many of them suffered a violent death. Every time somebody arose to stand for the banner of God, they were hated and killed. The dark shadow that Satan had cast over the world grew deeper and deeper yet. Through heathenism, Satan had for ages turned men away from God. But he won his greatest triumph in perverting what? The faith of Israel. The people that God had called to live right and show right and educate the world. Satan made them his main target. In perverting the faith of Israel, he had his greatest triumph. By contemplating and worshipping their own conceptions, they took the things that God had instituted for worship and began to worship them. The heathen had lost a knowledge of God and had become more and more corrupt. Israel continued to commit abomination, adultery with the other gods. And so they could not even show them light. They allowed their light to be extinguished. So it was with Israel. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. I want us to remember that. Look and survey every religion. The one that you're in. The one that pervades the world. And you can know a false religion when the, when the ability to save yourself lie in the things that you do. Or they ask you to do. This had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Rites and ceremonies. Laws upon laws upon laws upon laws that seemingly made them holy. But it was Satan who had implanted this principle. And wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. The minute we think that there are things we can do to appease God and base our religion upon these things, you will have no barrier against sin. Sin will be rife among the ranks. Sin will reign in the mortal body. And we will learn to become numb to it. Living in sin. Not ever fully accomplishing the purpose of God to overcome it. This is taken from Desire of Ages. 
chapter 3, if you want to know. Desire of Ages, written by Ellen White. This quote was taken from that. So I just shared with you some quotes to get an understanding of where we are going, my friends. So in light of everything that I just said, what is the matrix? So we can understand it very clearly today. I will take the excerpt from the movie to describe the matrix to you and see if it makes sense. The matrix is everywhere. One of the main characters said, according to the uh, question, what is the matrix? It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Lord have mercy. The other one said, what truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, into a prison that you cannot taste or see or touch. It is a prison for your mind. I just want you to think about the world that we live in and not tell me, Elder, it is so true. Born into a world of bondage, this world is designed as a prison. You see, here is the thing. If I ask for your depiction of the world and I tell you what does the world look like, you will tell me it looks like this. It's beautiful cities, majestic cities in all the worlds that you, in all the different countries that you go to. You will see tall buildings. You will see streets paved. You will see fashion. You will see all the glamour and glitz of the buildings. It's beautiful in the night, all lit up. This, oh, this is what the cities look like. You will picture the world and it will look like this majestic art of nature here. Wonderful mountains, beautiful rivers, a clear blue sky. That is the world that is presented. But I want to ask you a, a question today. Do you ever think of the world like this? This utter chaos and ruin. Do you ever think that this is the world that you live in now? I know it's not, it doesn't look like this now, but I want you to understand today very clearly that this is its reality. This is the reality of the world that we live in. And until we begin to see it as this, my friends, we will not understand what it means to be wholly detached from it. It is a world fitted for destruction. Its destruction has already been predicted in the history of time through the word of God. The Bible has stated plainly that the world will not withstand the coming of Christ. Earthquakes will destroy it, ravage it. The buildings that have been built up by man will be destroyed. So this is its reality. But the devil wants us to simply think that this is it for eternity. These cities will last an eternity. This nature will last an eternity. And so we hold on to it for dear life. We hold on to its principles. We hold on to it. We don't want to die. We don't want to leave it. We don't want to claim the new world that Christ has said he will make. The new Jerusalem which will come down from heaven. That is the eternal one. But the devil wants us to think that the world in its current condition is eternal. And so the matrix is that world. That world that has been carefully built to keep us as slaves. To keep us subject to it. All the days of our lives without ever claiming the world to come. The system of the matrix is also described as a system that is designed to turn a human being into this, a battery. That is the system it's designed and what it reduces a human being to. Now you may tell me today, Elder, I don't feel like a battery. I, you got to break that down for me. Let me tell you this. We wake up every single morning. After a good night's rest, sometimes not even a good one. 
we brush our teeth, we take a nice shower, we put our clothes on, we have a nice breakfast in whatever order we do it. We charge ourselves up only to give 8 to 10 to 12 to 14, 15, some push it. 16, 18, 19 hours a day, we give of ourselves to this world in whatever work that we do. We expend our energy. We have a few breaks here or there. Some don't even bother with breaks because they have to get the job done. We do this morning, noon, and we do this day after day after day, sorry. Five days a week, some of us push it. Some of us take a break off for Saturday, we go to church. But we go to work Saturday nights even sometimes to make up for it. Those who don't go to church on Saturday, go to work. Those who, go to, those who don't go to church on Sunday, go to work. Some say, I don't care about church, go to work seven days a week. Giving time, giving energy, giving our resources, my friends. Some of us, sometimes we, we, you know, we can't get it up in the morning. We wake up. We are, we, we are drowsy. We are weak. The world says, I've got the solution for you. I've got five-hour energy. You like coffee? Coffee's going to give you a spark. Take some caffeine. Take a banana. I've got an energy bar for you. You've got to recharge that battery so you can get back to work and put your time and effort until one day that battery can no longer function. No matter how much Red Bull you drink, no matter how much coffee you drink, no matter how much energy bars you drink, there is no recharging the battery, so the job finds a new battery to replace you. Many people find themselves in a home after their battery has drained. At home or in a nursing home where all the dead batteries go, and they just wait for you to die. All your cells are dead, no more recharging, and they put you in the ground. And then the question is, what was all you wrought worth? Don't make a mistake this morning, my friends. I am not an advocacy for laziness. Every single person must work to make ends meet, to make a living, and to build principles in this world. But if it is our work alone that defines us, we're in trouble. What we work for is a key factor in where our heart and our mind is. We must understand that all the world requires of us is our resources. And we have to use them judiciously and in temperance so that we don't find ourselves used and abused and thrown away. I want that to cement itself in our mind. You know what the book says? 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. Now the Bible uses this to describe the false prophet. But I want to make an application today. I want to apply that to the leaders of our world. They promise liberty. How many politicians have come out and tell you they promise you liberty. They promise you better taxes. They promise you a better community. They promise you a crime-free society. They promise you a spread of the wealth. How many have come through the history of time and promised you liberty but the Bible says they themselves are the servants of corruption. How many of them has it been found out of that they are nothing but corrupt? You know why, my friends? Because they have been overcome by corruption. I want you to understand, in the book of Daniel, when the Bible says Daniel had a dream that needed an interpretation, and Gabriel was dispatched from heaven to bring the revelation to Daniel. But Gabriel said, I was detained by the prince of Persia. And Michael had to come and contend and help me overcome. 
and I go now because the prince of Greece is coming. Listen to me, my friends. We like to skirt around the issue when it comes to this topic. We like to think that it is just men that the angel is talking about. There is no man that can contend with an angel from heaven. There, the, the, I want you to understand this principle. Satan has fashioned his government the same way that God has. He didn't learn anything on his own. He's a created being. And he stood on the very mountain of God. He understands how to erect a government. And he himself is spirit. And so Satan's careful plan is to appoint a particular angel to every head of state that this world has ever known. That's why paganism has, ran, has reigned supreme in every nation that has ran through the world. God has saved people from the paganism in the nation. But the principles of the nation were pagan. He has ascribed somebody to each leader in this world because that is the way his principles will be fulfilled. That's why the Bible says, we battle spiritual wickedness in high places. It stands to reason that the men and women who are making decisions that affect us every day of our lives, that Satan will target them carefully and motivate them through their actions to, to, to bring the world into subjection to him and his principles. Listen to this. Listen to this, my friends. 2 Timothy 3.12 Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Doing what? Deceiving and being deceived. It is a continuous process. When Satan comes into a man and possesses a man, he, through deceiving that man, that man continues to deceive others. We cannot expect the evils of the world to be extinguished unless men turn their hearts from Satan to Christ. Listen to this as well. Behold the hour cometh, Jesus says, Yea, is now come, that, a, that he shall be scattered, every man to his own, and he shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. When the time is coming that he will be arrested, he says you will be scattered because of the condition that you are in. You will be scattered because of the evils that you will see happening. I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you that in me he might have peace. In the world he will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that's, I want us to understand what Jesus is saying when he says, I have overcome the world. I described to you the world. The world and the illusion that it presents to man. The world and its leadership that many of them are prompted by the evil one. The world that Jesus says, I will leave you in. You will be scattered. But you will have peace eventually through me. In the world you have tribulation. But I want you to understand I have overcome the world. Now, to understand that principle, wait a minute. Jesus went, he left. The world still stands today in 2020. Evil men are waxing worse and worse. How do we understand that I have overcome the world? Hence we come to freeing the mind remember what i said the matrix has you is your mind free and i carefully chose this because the mind houses a brain but within that brain the principle of the brain is the mind the mind is the central intelligence agency of every human being every human being the mind is also called the citadel mind definition the element of a person that enables them to be aware of the world and their experiences to think and to feel nothing that you do 
is absent in the mind. The very things that you see must be processed in the mind to tell you. Your very speech, your very heartbeat, even though the brain needs oxygen and blood to run, the brain must tell the heart to beat. The brain must tell your hands to move. The brain must define what reaction to what, whether you laugh, whether you cry, based on the circumstance. The mind is the citadel. It is the faculty of consciousness and thought. The citadel is, is, de is defined as a fortress. So your mind is a fortress, my friends. Let's go to the book of Romans 12, verse 1. Book of Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, and I call this the ideal and the call. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you do what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Not just anyone, one that is holy, one that is acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. How do we understand that? Let's run to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Let's understand that process. When God says this is the ideal, that's what I want from you. That's what I call you to do. We must understand that call so we can understand what we need to do. The book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and I put them on the screen so that you can go to them as we do them. Listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. You know why they couldn't do this? Listen to verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshiper, because that the worshippers, once purged, should have had no more what? Conscience of sins. It's not just about the killing of sheep. That's why it was pointing to something. There is no way these sacrifices could have purged their conscience. But what do the sacrifices mean? But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Every time you sacrifice that sheep, that lamb, every time was a remembrance of what you did. So you have to continually do it because your conscience is not clear. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It's not possible. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou preparedst me. In burnt sacrifices and off in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. It's not a pleasing work to kill a lamb. Every single day, sprinkle this there, sprinkle that there. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice an offering, and burnt offerings, an offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. It was the requirement of their time. Jesus had not come. Yes, they were to be obedient in doing it. I want us to understand that. We live under a different dispensation from them. They had to do it as God said do it. It required obedience. But they must also learn its principle. That was the problem with Jerusalem. But listen to what the Bible says. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. What is God's will, O God? He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. He took away all these things, that he may establish what is the principle 
and the principal meaning of everything that they did and every one of us that was supposed to be alive today in 2020. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of what? The body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Once and for all. There is no more need to sacrifice bulls and goats. There was one sacrifice made on Calvary. Listen to verse 14. Run to verse 14 of Hebrews 10. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Are you beginning to understand the work of Christ? To cleanse us. Not, 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 just, not just in theory, my friends. This is something that is supposed to happen. Listen to what verse 16 says. This is now the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. And where will I write them? In their minds. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin, my friends. I will write my laws in their hearts. I will put it in their minds. I will put it in the central intelligence agency. Once the central intelligence agency is taken care of, it will motivate the body to function the way it is supposed to. I want us to understand that. So, Christ has a mission for the mind. But I want us to understand, it was also true for Israel. Their minds could have still been worked upon. We have many examples of the faith of Moses and of Abraham, of Jacob and Isaac, men no different from the Israelites. But their minds were different. So I want us to understand how the citadel is broken by Satan. Let's go to Exodus chapter 1. Satan has a plan. He has a plan in breaking the citadel that is still working today as it did for the children of Israel. Remember what Brother Silvan Calendar read earlier in, in, I believe, 1 Corinthians. These things happen to them for ensamples. For these things happen to the children of Israel as in samples for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. Everything that happened to them was for a witness for us. So we must understand how our, our minds, how Satan wants our minds to be broken. Listen to this. Exodus chapter 1. <clears throat> verse from verse 8. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt. Which knew not Joseph. Doesn't mean he didn't know of Joseph. But he didn't have that intimate relationship with Joseph. Nor cared about the principles of that Joseph stood for. Or the former, former Pharaoh who honored him. And he said unto his people. Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Let us deal wisely with them. Lest they multiply and it come to pass. That when there falleth out any war. They join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. What did Pharaoh do? He set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. That is a careful and selected plan by Pharaoh to render God's people with the mind of a slave. A broken citadel. He did, remember, he didn't start by killing their firstborn. He started by making their lives hard with bondage. They were building treasure cities for Pithom and Ramses. They were subject to the Egyptians. The Egyptians exercised lordship over them. Beat them. Made them serve with rigor. So tell me. If someone puts you in that position and breaks your will and breaks your mind, 
What do you think happens to your mind? Now, do you want to know what a broken citadel looks like? Let's run to Exodus chapter 32. Let's see what a broken citadel looks like. Remember what I just told you. All their lives in Egypt, after Joseph, they served with rigor. Year after year after year after year, till 400 years had passed. These people were, the people born then were born into slavery. All they knew was slavery. All their predecessors taught them was slavery. Yes, there was a time where Joseph existed and our living was good, but that was a distant 400 years ago. All we know is slavery. We born into it. So listen to Exodus 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said, Up, Aaron, make us gods, which shall go before us. For you see this man Moses that brought us up out of the land of Egypt? We wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears, which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in the ears and brought them unto Aaron. He received them at the hand, fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. What does a broken citadel look like? The broken citadel was when Moses went up on the mount to commune with God, they perceived that there is no way this man could still be alive. They were delivered from Egypt by the hand of the Almighty God, which launched an attack, who, sorry, launched an attack on all the gods of Egypt. But the minute Moses, who had spent 40 days in the mountain, the minute they did not see him, and perceived that this man was gone, they said, wait a minute, we need a God to lead us. Now I want you to notice that they did not tell Aaron to make them a calf. They said, make us gods. But Aaron knew what to make. Because the calf was one of the chief, if not the chiefest, of Egyptian gods. Every one of the crowns had the two horns of the bull. Aaron knew exactly what to make because in the citadel was implanted all the, all the gods of Egypt. And the mind of Egypt was still there. You want another witness? Exodus chapter 16 verse 3. Exodus 16 verse 3. A broken citadel. Listen to what the Bible says. Exodus 16 verse 3. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for he had brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They were dying in Egypt out of slavery, but they were not satisfied with where God was leading them. They said we would have rather to have been in Egypt. Oh, my friends, run to 17 verse 3 for another witness. And the people thirsted there for water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide he with me? Wherefore do he tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children? And our cattle with thirst. And Moses cried unto the Lord saying. Lord what shall I do unto these people. They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses. Go on before the people. And take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod. Wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand. And go. So here it is. Every time the people faced a situation. They wanted to go back to Egypt because they were subject to Egypt. 
Egypt had subjected them to a broken citadel. And so they were dependent upon Egypt. Every principle that they were about was Egypt. They believed the freedom that God was offering was just their freedom from Egypt. But God was working on them to help them see something better than that, my friends. God wanted them to be free in mind. To understand. That's why he always said, remember, remember, remember. Observe the Passover. Observe the feasts. And remember, he was trying to re-emphasize in their minds. I am your God. I still love you. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You are a chosen generation. You are unlike every nation in this world. But they couldn't, that couldn't register in their minds because they were constantly just thinking of their circumstances and thinking in the flesh. And so the Bible says, I expect you, the Lord says, it is your reasonable service to offer yourself as a sacrifice. Now the word reasonable comes from the root word logicos, which means the most logical thing that anybody could do is present their bodies a living sacrifice. How is a sacrifice presented? The lamb come, the lamb is taken, the lamb is slain, the lamb is subject to what the requirement of the sacrifice is. What we do is come to the Lord and present ourselves to him that his will will be accomplished with us. A living sacrifice, which means he's not going to kill us. He's just going to kill the fleshly part of us. I want us to understand that. He wants the spirit to reign. So the flesh must die. We are a living sacrifice because we are constantly presenting ourselves to him. And that is our reasonable service. And then the Bible says, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, that he may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word conformed comes from the word suskematizo, or you can find system from it, or scheme, or schematic, conformed. Properly assuming a similar outward form by following the same pattern. Be not conformed to the world by simply following its pattern. So, you must become aware of its pattern so that you will not follow it. I just detail to you the principle of this world and the pattern that it follows. You must not follow it, the Lord says. The world has a scheme, which is a large-scale plan. You must be aware of that. By understanding its pattern, you know where it's going. You know its large-scale plan. The word, now, there is a, 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 a thing called a schematic plan. A schematic plan means that the plan you are watching uses elements to detail the system using symbols. You're watching the plan, say for instance, there is a plan to build your house. You are watching the schematic plan of your house. You are watching symbols that represent a door, a wall, a toilet, a tub, the plumbing, the electrical system. You are watching the schematic, the intricate details of the plan using symbols. So listen to this, my friends. Look at this building. This building is a building that is called the European Union Building. Its motto, out of many peoples, one. Keep that in mind. That is the European Union Building. Listen to the other, look at the other one. This is a, the 96, the 83rd Street Station. The, 80, the 86th, the 83rd Street Station in New York City. This word, Excelsior, if you can see it properly. 
This word excelsior is displayed in the station and many stations like it. In the 96th Street station, the 2nd Avenue subway, E are those words, E pluribus unum. These words are also on the uh, American currency. It is the motto of this country. I just want to share these three things with you to highlight a greater point. I could show you symbols all day long, but these three are prominent and I want to tell you why. E pluribus unum is the U.S. motto, meaning out of many, one. Remember what I told you the European Union uses? Let's go back. Out of many peoples, one. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. The word excelsior, ever upward or higher. Let's take that to the Bible, my friends. Out of many, one. Out of many peoples, one. Excelsior, ever upward, going higher. Do you know what man's greatest feat is? Man's greatest feat is not in the world we live in today. Man's greatest feat can be found in Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, post-flood. Let's run to Genesis 11. Post-flood, the Bible says it's a familiar story. The world was, the whole earth was of one language, of one speech. They came and found the land of Shinar. And it is there the decision was made, just like that. Let us make brick. Burn them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and slime for mortar. And they said, go to. Let us build a tower whose top may reach heaven. Let us make a name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Bible says the Lord God came down. To see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Listen to what the Lord said. That's an admission from the Lord God Almighty. Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Their minds were one. One purpose. One motive. God had to intervene, my friends. Do you understand the level of intellect man had then? We think we have intellect now. People are still amazed how the pyramids were built. Engineers can't even understand. They said Martians built it. They can't even fathom the pyramids being built with utter precision. precision. But man came together and was building this tower. God had to confound their language so they would disperse. And so, in this modern world, the building you saw representing the European Union building is an unfinished tower of Babel that they plan to finish. The very system that this world has adapted with the principles out of many one is that one day we will again become one. We will unite together. And any force that threatens this world we will stand against it. One nation, one world religion, one currency. The Bible says there will come a time where man will not be permitted to buy or sell because we will not conform to the system. We think these things to be conspiracy theory. They're all going one place. The duty of every person is to recognize that they must not conform to that system. I go to stores every single day. I go all these places every single day. And people are just talking about vaccine. Oh, mark of the beast. Vaccine and mark of the beast. I've got news for you. Even though you reject the vaccine, unless you come to Christ, you will bow to the beast. Vaccine or not, we are focused on vaccine but not focused on the spiritual workings of the enemy in this world. Who are you kidding? Christ and only Christ's mind can save you from the mark of the beast. 
This is a spiritual work. Everything we see in the forefront is motivated by spirit. And if you don't have the right spirit, you will bow to the system of the world. There is a term that says, listen, man's inner desire is simply power. And powerful men will continue to seek power, not God. Satan promised man in the Garden of Eden power. You will be like him. You don't need him. There is a saying that power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. I want to share a better quote with you today. Power doesn't always corrupt. It depends on the power. Author Robert Caro has said, reflecting on Lyndon B. Johnson, power always reveals. When you have enough power to do what you always wanted to do, then you see what the guy always wanted to do. You see, when you want to serve God, it requires power. That power doesn't corrupt. When you see what that power does in the apostles, in every follower of Christ from the, from the time they receive the Holy Spirit, you see what the person always wanted to do. If your intention is to serve God, then his power through you will be a ministering power. But when you see government officials, when you see all those who call themselves leaders in, in finance and in society, even in religious circles, when you see that power causes them to usurp authority over anybody, then you recognize it is a selfishness in them that is magnified through the power that they receive. Not everyone who says they receive power from an eye receives power from God, my friends. So power helps you to recognize what the person really is on the inside. So the question I want to, uh, the question we will be asking is, okay, you say, Elder, that there is a matrix. You say our minds must be free. So the question is, how do we break free from the matrix? I ask you to, I will tell you today, how did Neo, the character in the matrix, break free? And how it is no different. Neo, in order to break free from the matrix, had to be reborn. He went through a process of rebirth and then he was sent back into the matrix. But when he went back into the matrix, he was not subject to it. He was able to manipulate things in the matrix to use against the forces of evil. Listen to this analogy, my friends. It's all biblical. He was born again and when he walked through the matrix, he saw things differently. He was able to manipulate it so that he could accomplish his purpose. My friends, when Jesus came to this earth, Jesus walked in the matrix of his time. Was he able to manipulate the waves and the sea? Was he able to bring to life the dead? Was he able to heal the sick, cure the blind? Was he able to command things and it came to pass? Lord have mercy. It is no different to us. That's why the Bible says, do not be conformed to the matrix, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Run with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, 23. Let's understand that principle. Listen, my friends. Let's get, let, let's, let's get deep into this thing before we depart here. I want you to get it because when I'm done here today, none of us should be subject to the matrix. All we should be working for is the renewing of the mind. Let's get into this. Listen, Ephesians chapter 4, 23 and 24. I want you to see it. I want you to believe it. I want you to claim it. Ephesians 4, 23, 24. And be renewed in the what? Spirit of your mind. And that he put on the new man, which after God is created. How is he created? In righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. 
This, this is, you know, this is serious brain surgery that is going to happen here. Being renewed in the spirit of your mind, having your mind being motivated through the inspiration of the spirit of God. And then you put on the new man, the character of God. Uh, the, in Christ Jesus after accepting him. Created in righteousness and true holiness. Run with me to Colossians 3. Colossians 3. I'm reading from verse 9. Lie not one to another. Seeing that he have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge. After the image of him that created him. Putting on the new man means feeding yourselves on the word of God and everything spiritual that feeds the spirit that your mind is changed. That when you leave your, the door of your house and you go out into the world, your eyes begin to see differently. When you hear the speech of a president, a prime minister, a king, a queen, you can dissect thoroughly what they are saying from what they are not. When you look at the news, when you read the newspaper, you can dissect what is happening because you have the schematic of the world in your mind. And then you have the spirit of God bringing to knowledge the things that you must learn and see. When you look at a movie, when you read a book, when you're talking to people, when you're listening to a sermon, you can see through all the web of lies and deceit. Because the Spirit of God is motivating you to think and to feel and to process the happenings of the world. Run to John 15. John 15. John 15, 15 and 16. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples. And listen to what Jesus is saying to you right now. Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. If you're going to live by the world, then you are a servant to the world. And the servant will never know what his Lord doeth. Satan, listen to me brethren. I want to make that statement as the Lord brings it to my mind. The men you think that have power in this world has an illusion of power. Satan never reveals to his people all the plans that he has for their destruction. He just wants them to lust after earthly power. They can fulfill his purpose and they will reap the benefits of that destruction when Jesus comes. That's why Freemasons at the lower levels believe that they are serving God. They believe that all is well. This is a Christian organization. But when you are 33rd degree Freemason, you understand who you are serving because to make it that far, you are subject to everything that they have taught you. And so the illusion of power is what has captivated people. The servant of Satan will never fully know what he's about. But here is what God says. I have not called you servants. I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever he shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You see, I am sending you out there as my fruit to bear fruit. The purpose of God's friends is to know everything that they need to know for their time and for their mission. Because ultimately, in the matrix, their mission was to free others. And Christ's mission was to send his agents out there so that while they have been made free, others should be made free. And so this quote comes into play. That we must understand when it comes to our work as agents of Christ. The matrix is a system. The system is our enemy. When you're inside, it was told to kneel. Look around, what do you see? You see doctors, businessmen, lawyers, 
carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still part of the system and that makes them our enemy. Most of the people are not ready to be unplugged. Many of them are so inured, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. And that's why you have people fighting today to protect this world and its principles. And whenever you bring to them true freedom in Christ, they persecute, they fight, they shut you up. This world is taking Christ more and more out of its circulation. I showed you two things that they have posted in the subways in New York City. Iproribus Unam and Excelsior. But wait a minute, why don't you post in the subway, One Nation Under God? Why don't you post in the subway, principles that you say govern this nation in god we trust if you post in god we trust someone will be offended and fight to take it down we rather have april rebus unum and excelsior that detail our principles but the point of the matter is people will fight to protect a system that has enslaved them and they will fight you when you try to show them that the system is broken and the system is not good. That's why God says to his disciples in John 15, 18 to 21. If the world hate you, he know that it hated me before it hated you. He walked in it, they hated him. If you were of the system, the system would love its own. But ye are not of the system. I have chosen you out of it, therefore it hateth you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours, Jesus says. Let's run to Philippians 2, 5 to 11. We are winding down now. We are winding down. Philippians chapter 2. I want you to understand these principles as we continue our mission. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this what? Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What is the mind that was in Christ? He in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was part of the eternal Godhead. However, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant made in the likeness of men and found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And through that death, God have highly exalted him, given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, even the things that are under the earth. And let every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Take on the form of Christ. Humble ourselves as a servant. Descend in spirit to his feet. Allow him through his sacrifice to cover us. Allow his life, his character that he lived to be the character that we desire to live. And in desiring to live like him, may we invite his Holy Spirit into our hearts to break us to mold us to fashion us and to walk according to his principles and his mind will reign supreme in us first peter chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 to reinforce this first peter chapter 2 from verse 20 for what glory is it if when he buffeted for your faults he take it patiently but if when he do well and suffer for it, he take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. Yes, we are buffeted. Yes, we are tempted. Yes, we are tried. 
But if we take it patiently, my friends, it is acceptable to God for even heron to what he called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that he should follow, he, he should follow his steps, steps to Christ who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. He could have wiped out everyone that touched him. He could have vanquished everyone that nailed him, that spat on him, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body, on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes he were healed. We were a sheep gone astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. My friends, when I teach you about the matrix, when I teach you about the system, when I teach you about your mind that is free, I am not teaching it to you so that you can be subservient to anyone or any system. I am teaching it to you and it has been taught to me so that we all can be independently free because I want you to understand the principle today. Church is also part of the system of the matrix. Judge the one that you're in yourself. I'm telling you this. When you receive spiritual foresight, you can dissect the church from the top down. Here is how I want you to understand it. Number one, the truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Just set it free and it will defend itself. You don't need to defend the truth. The truth is its own defense because the truth is Christ and it will always stand the test of time. I want you to understand this. Does the church want people, does the church want people to overcome sin for their personal benefit or for the church? Is the church asking you today to live for them or live for God? Is the church that you're in motivating you to be an independent child of God or dependent upon its system? Has the minister you serve usurped authority over you? Does he demand your supreme obedience or does he point you to obey the living God? This is not singular to any denomination. Assess it as the spirit of God gives you wisdom. Because today, I want you to be able to think and act independent of the spirit of God that is in you. And finally, my brethren, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I am Paul. I am a preacher of the gospel, but I am pointing you to the source of your salvation and the one who can help you. In all your matters, even when I'm not there. When we're subservient to men, there's only so far men can take us. But men should point us to the one who takes us all the way. For it is God which worketh in you. It is God which worketh in you. It is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, my friends. It is God that works in us to change our minds to awaken us to our condition, to awaken us to the world, to give us the mind that we need, my friends. I also want you to write down 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Paul says, you are our epistle written in our hearts. Paul says, listen, 
the epistle is to lead you to Christ. But the very joy of the ministry is, is the people coming to Christ and being independent and growing in Christ. The joy of the ministry is not just to say, I baptize such and such. The joy of the ministry is that you have led someone to Christ and they are able to stand on their own two feet. The joy of a mother is to bring a helpless child into the world, nurse that child, help that child to grow up to be a, a strong man or woman that they can stand on their own two feet. That is the joy of the ministry, my friends. For as much as he was manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God's word, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. My brethren, I trust that today I have awakened you, just motivated you to think about the world that you live in and your perspective of it in the coming week. Yes, you have to go to work. Yes, we have to go to school. Yes, we have professions. Yes, we have things we do in this world that earn us a living as well as pertain to the function of this world. But I am telling you today, our trust cannot simply be in our own abilities. Our trust and faith cannot simply be in our jobs. Our perspective of the world has to exceed that. The men and women of this world in leadership positions, I believe they could lead, but they can only lead when they submit themselves to the living God. As long as they are part of the system, they will do what the system wants. And the Bible has told us what the system is. The Bible has defined our nations as beasts and beasts will continue to operate as beasts. Beasts bring other things into subservience to them. Beasts destroy. Beasts war against each other for power. And we know that in the last days, this nation is represented as a lamb-like beast. Yes, it looks like a lamb. Yes, it bleeds like a little lamb. Yes, it presents itself as a spiritual nation. But it is a nation, the Bible says, that will one day enforce the mark of the beast. There is no escaping what this nation will do. And I don't care what part of the world you live in. When, your, when decisions will be made, your leaders will be summoned to the United States. Under the United Nations, where laws are continuing to be passed. And rights will be infringed on. And an image will be set up. None of us, my friends, will not feel it. And so knowing this, the only safe assurance is the mind of Christ that will help us navigate this world, that will keep things in perspective. So I trust today that your outlook on life will change and that your sole desire will be to serve the living God and have his mind become your mind so that you can be wise for your time and stand in the face of all persecution. Just before I pray, I want you to listen to this song. Doing good deeds, sowing good seeds, living behind me faithful each day quick to obey that's how I want the Lord to find me when he comes again when he comes Doing my 
best stand in the test that's how i want the lord to find me i trust my friends you're listening to the words of this song how do you want the lord to find you it's very important it is the question of the day how do i want god to find me listen if there's somebody out there who's watching this program right now and who will watch it later on when it's posted on youtube or continue to watch it on facebook you have a decision to make and you want help to make that decision you want a bible study you want a prayer to help you make that decision because we're not going to force you to accept anything the Spirit of God will make the prompting. You will decide to accept or not. But you can't delay, my friends. If you hear it now, harden not your heart. If you want to make that decision today, feel free to contact One Accord Christian Service. You are Pastor Silburn Calendar, and you have myself, Brother Emile. Just contact us via Facebook, via WhatsApp, whatever it is. That you, you, the decision that you need to make or the prayers that you need, feel free to contact us or call us via Facebook or WhatsApp. And we are ready to minister to you, to lead you to Christ. To lead you to Christ, not to a system. To lead you to Christ. Understand this principle. I want to pray for you this evening. I'm motivated to pray and then my wife will close us off with the rest of the song. I want to pray for us out there today that God will do a great work and continue to do a great work because what is happening in the world is people are being prepared for the end times. People's eyes are being opened. People are requesting baptisms all over the world. People are asking questions and, and some are even saying the mark of the beast is coming, which means they know the deal. They just, needs to under, they just need to understand the principle of it. Some of them just have it a little wrong. They need to understand the heart of the matter. And it is upon us to help them understand. But we must be convicted of it. Father in heaven, I thank you today for having led us to, dis to disseminate your word. First, in the morning, the principle of understanding the crossing of Jabbok. And what we must do, dear father, as Jacob did to gain to gain a blessing and favor and strength from you, even as a broken man. And now, dear Father, as I have shared the principles of the system of the world, there is so much information I can give, but what you have allowed me to share, I have shared. And I pray that it has motivated your people to think and to now act, not to continue to be part of simply that system, but to break free from it through the power and might of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his mind, which should be our mind. I pray for someone today who needs to go all the way with you, who's, who's hesitating, who's wondering when, whether to make that decision. Convict them in the name of Jesus. And may they, dear Father, commit their lives to you. I pray for some of us who may have been a bit misled. We are on the path, but we are not there all the way. We need to break free from whatever is holding us back and go all the way with you now. Times are wasting. The devil is getting more desperate. Oh Lord, we're in a system that one day will look upon us as an enemy that needs to be eradicated. We must be ready to stand for you, come what may, even though death is before us. We must be ready to stand. In the name of Jesus, convict us to let go of whatever things in this world we hold dear to so that we can stand in that day. Lord, you know the will and purpose of this ministry to awaken men to the true condition of this world, to awaken men to the reality of life and lead them spiritually, not by our own strength, not by our own intelligence, but lead them to Christ who is the author and finisher of their faith and the educator of this world. I thank you for what you have done today. And I thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit upon the hearts of your people. Dismiss us with your blessing and keep us through the remainder of this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us, my friends. Thank you for your continued support. 
I trust that the message has reached your hearts today. And I pray and ask for your prayers. Continue to pray for us so that God will continue to inspire us and give us the strength to do this work. It is not an easy work. It is a work that is met by much criticism. But we are focused on Christ. He promised us that we will be persecuted. We are not taken aback by it. We are not shaken by it. But we want you to continue to pray for us as we pray for you that this work will be done. Jesus will come and we will be one family in his kingdom. God bless you. Shabbat Shalom. Happy Sabbath. Giving my all, heeding his call, letting no selfishness bind me, holding his hand firmly to stand. That's how I want the Lord to find me when he comes again, when he comes again. And who may he find me faithful to him? Do That's how I want the Lord to find me, serving my Lord, true to His word, daring the tempter to bind me. burdens to bear. That's how I want the Lord to find me when he comes again, when he comes again. And oh, may he find me faithful to him, doing my best, stand in the test, and that's how I want the Lord to find.